Well, good morning. I don't know why you invited me here today. You've already had several sermons, and we could take them home and put them in to place and to action, and uh, our lives would be greatly increased, and our relationship with our God uh, would be uh, immensely enhanced by just what we've uh, heard this morning. I feel kind of like, uh, you know, go, the pastor going to the church for the first time, sort of looking out and seeing folk that they don't know and uh, what the congregation will be that they will sort of give guidance to for some uh, period of time. Sandy, my wife and I, and Sandy's here this morning. I can't see where she's sitting, but she's out there somewhere. Sandy and I, you know, uh, had never been over to New Leaf, and so this is a, a new experience for us to be here. This is a great church. This is a great church. A lot going on uh, in this place. I feel a little bit like uh, Paul the Apostle. You know, he writes all of those letters in the New Testament, and to, he writes some of those letters to churches he's either founded or he's familiar with. Uh, he's visited, and he gives their words of encouragement or uh, correction or whatever it is that he brings to their to their life through his letters. But some of the letters that he writes, he says, I don't know you, but I've heard about you. I mean, he says it a little bit different than that, obviously, but that's pretty much what he, what he says. He says, I haven't heard about you, but I've, I've heard about your faith. I've heard about your ministry. I heard about the way you're, you're loving in the name of Jesus, how you're giving and how you're making a difference in the world. And in the very brief time, uh, that uh, I've been here this morning. And by the way, I, I went to the internet. I found out where you were and a little bit of who you are by virtue of the things that you've written about yourself. I've heard about you and I've heard about some of the things that uh, you've been doing and are doing in the name of the risen one who loves supremely. The one who has given his life for us and offers us not only life that is incredible in this world, but uh, a life that uh, continues uh, for all eternity. I resonated a little bit with a gentleman, I'm sorry, I forget your name, that just gave uh, testimony uh, this morning. Um, I, I didn't exactly have what I'd call an earth-shattering uh, experience of, of a life change coming to Christ and having my world turned upside down. Exactly, but believe me, it was like radical. And uh, I thought that, you know, when I first started out in ministry a long time ago, hair was a little bit different color then. Uh, but many years ago when I, you know, entered into this life, life of ministry, I thought, well, everybody ought to have a similar experience to the one that I've encountered. You know, your life is going along and you're not giving any thought really to uh, God or what that God might mean for your life and uh, any direction for your life. Uh, God is sort of out of the daily equation. And, and uh, I thought everybody sort of had to have that kind of an encounter. The details, the minutia of the, of the experience might be a little bit different, but everybody ought to be able to identify and sort of bring that to light and, and talk about it. Until I went to my very first church, <laughs> little country church down in the middle center of, of Ohio. And there was a lady in my first church, and her name was Addie Bales. Now, Addie Bales' name will never be on a marquee board anywhere. She will not be known by many people beyond her little circle of life. But she was an incredible lady of faith. Wonderful, wonderful person. And I was visiting her in her home, and I said to Addie, I said, Addie, tell me about, about your relationship with Jesus. I says. I says, it's obvious that you've had this uh, encounter with the living God, the one, one who has redeemed you and offered you this beautiful experience of living side by side with, with Christ. And she says, Reverend Brown, she says, I don't know a time that Jesus was not my friend. Isn't that incredible? She says, I've just always known Jesus. He's been a part of my life. And I've always sort of lived with Jesus as though he's sort of right there with me. Kind of like the children's story that was told this morning about the Bible and the cell phone. Incredible message, by the way. I felt like we should maybe go home after, 
after that. And I really like the way the kids sort of hung on to that phone. Can you imagine those kids not knowing what a cell phone is today? Come on. Now, the Bible's a whole other matter, but uh, the whole message about, uh, about that Bible and the God that is spoken of in that Bible and comes to life through that Bible and teaches us and leads us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in that Bible never lets us down, never, never lets go. And I might add also in the most difficult of times, we experience and encounter that God in living color. You know. I know your pastor, I don't know Scott real well, I must confess, but I was on the board of ordained ministry when Scott came through that process. I almost turned him down. No, I did not really. <laughs> I remember Scott as being an excellent candidate, actually, and I was quite proud of the fact that, that he had felt that call to ministry and was coming into our conference and was going to be leading churches as a result of that. And uh, no time in our life uh, is God closer and draws closer to us than when challenges face us and when the sort of big question mark of life is in front of us and we don't know what the next move will be or how it's going to end and all of those kinds of things. Of course, Scott's right there. And I'll tell you, Sandy and I will put this church and Scott on our prayer list, as I know you have been praying for your pastor as well. Well, anyway, let me uh, offer a, a passage scripture. By the way, it's very dangerous. I look at my watch here because I, I figure I've got about 45 minutes. No, not really. But uh, it's very dangerous to offer a pastor a pulpit who's retired and hasn't preached for a while. Passage of Scripture today comes from the book of Joshua. It's a passage you probably have heard of, maybe read yourself uh, in the past. Uh, Joshua and that uh, the folk uh, from from uh, uh, from Israel that had been, you know, in Egypt and had been slaves and gone through that whole process of deliverance at the hand of Moses and all that sort of long period of time that they floundered and wandered in the wilderness. That's all now be behind them. Moses has passed away. Joshua has sort of taken the mantle and is leading that, uh, those folk. Uh, and they're ready to go over into that promised land. Boy, did it take them a long time to get there. You know, they must have been excited about, uh, about that uh, experience of finding, finding a home, <laughs> a place where they can plant their feet and put down roots, you know. They've been, they've been through a lot. And, uh, and now they're on the other side of that, and they're ready to settle down. Joshua, at the end of the book of Joshua, he writes these words to the, Pope, to the folk. Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faith. Now, my inclination and the way we normally do things when we read Scripture is we just sort of race through that. You know, it's just one sentence, and we just keep on going. And uh, I don't want us to do that too quickly today. Now, therefore, folk, he's looking out at these wonderful people that have gone through so much, had this vision and this hope and this promise of having a place that was going to be, quote, unquote, milk and honey. It was going to be a place where they can finally rest their souls and their feet. He says, now therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faith. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt. Now, now we would sort of maybe get lost in that, and we would have some sort of theological discussion about what those gods were. But in reality, there are gods that we serve all over the place all the time. I love cars. It's a good thing I don't have a lot of money. I mean, I, I wouldn't have a garage big enough to hold all the cars, you know. That, so. But I have to be careful how I put those cars in my life in terms of the priority, and I don't worship them. Now, Sandy and I were blessed many years ago to, to go to a very, very affluent area in Florida as guests there and to preach there. And I'm telling you, there were gods all over the place. <laughs> So this, this really resonates 
for all time. It's, it's not just an ancient sort of experience, although it is. It isn't. That's why the scriptures are so timeless, you know. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. You know, I don't know about you, but I need to be reminded of that every day. As the testimony was just a few moments ago. Every day. To be reminded that, that God is my constant companion today. And what purpose does God have for my life today? Where is the journey of life going to take me today? What will be the priorities of the journey today? How many more days do I have? Well, let's not worry about that. Let's take care of the one that's what's, what's here now. And serve the Lord. Now if, now, if you are willing to serve the Lord, choice. You know, one of the things that you and I as Christian folk, as uh, regular worshipers, as people who've been hanging around the church for a while, one of the things that we uh, come to realize and put a lot of attention toward is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that redeems us and saves our lives and has brought us to a place in a relationship with God that we have had absolutely nothing to do in terms of getting there, it is simply by God's grace that he brings us there. Our pastor, my pastor now, talks a lot about the love of God, the inexplicable, the boundless, the, the, the love of God that we cannot even fathom. We put a lot of emphasis on that, and rightfully so. Rick, Rick Warren wrote a book, Purpose Driven Church, Purpose Driven Life, some years back now. But he talks in that, in that, in that book about it's not, it's not about you. It's about God. It's, it's coming to the place where we realize where God is in the world and in our lives. Amen? Amen. Okay. I want to make sure you're there. <laughs> but there is a piece in this Christian experience in life that does involve our making a decision. One of the things that is absolutely uh, 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 sort of throughout the scriptures, replete throughout the scriptures, is the participation that we have in making that choice daily of following Christ, wherever, wherever God leads us. I'll tell you, this is not part of the script, but I'll tell you, when thir- almost 40 years ago now, that since, uh, since I went to the ministry, I remember going to that first little church down in the country where Addie Bales was, Standing in here, I come out of the business community. I'm, 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 I'm a city dweller, and I'm down in the country. I, I don't know if I could have gotten home if somebody said, we're done, you know. But uh, I remember standing in that sanctuary saying, saying to God, I, I, God, you better know what you're doing because <laughs> I haven't the foggiest. But in the midst of that uncertainty, we make a choice as to whether or not we're going to follow, follow Christ. And so Joshua wants to say, say to this day you've got to choose whom you're going to serve, whether the gods of your ancestors who served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites wherein you dwell now amongst you and whose you are now living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We'll serve the Lord. We're going to make that choice. It's going to be a part of our, our, our living and our being. Then the people answered, I think we need to be very cautious and careful about, you know, the scriptures has got two ears because we need to listen a little more and speak a little less. But here they they are. Then the people answered, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, for it is the Lord our God who brought us uh, and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove us out before, uh, drove out before all of us, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord for he is our God. Amen. 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 Now, uh, we could have the first bullet point up. Uh, I think we can do that at some, at some point. There you go. So I want you to know today that that really is this whole idea of following has some measure of participation. Our it's really our choice as to whether or not we're going to serve 
the Lord. I'll give you a couple of illustrations of how this really works out in daily life. Sandy and I bought a car a few years back. We actually live in Chardon. We went way over to Belmont on the western part of the state. I was looking for a particular car, and, and we found this car. We were over there purchasing the car. In the midst of the, 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 the process of buying the car, uh, I, I mentioned to the, uh, to the dealer that I'd be financing a part of the automobile, and uh, and uh, whether or not he could get a good interest rate and, that, and that, that sort of thing. And so in that process, he became, he became aware that I was a minister. So uh, uh, he, he says, I can get you a good rate on your financing. And, uh, you know, I just noticed this clock up here. Now, that's very, very interesting. <laughs> just a side note, just a thought. But here we go. Let's go back to the car thing. I'm in the process of buying this car, and he tells me he can get this interest rate, and he mentioned something about credit union, and he says, we may have to tell a little fib. Hmm. I didn't say anything. So fast forward, we bought the car. I'm down in the basement at the house. Sandy's upstairs. We get a phone call from the fella. He says, we can get your uh, X percentage rate on your loan at the credit union, but we'll have to tell a little fib. And he said, or you can pay a little bit more and we can get it through, through the bank. And I says to Sandy, I said, well, we're not going to tell any fib. I says, well, we'll pay the little extra for the, for the interest rate. So we go to the dealership, and I discover that in the dealership, they've got a, a bet going on in the dealership whether or not the preacher will tell a fib to get the lesser interest rate. Choose today, folks, whom you will serve. See, another friend of mine, just a second illustration of this whole idea that, that we really do have to make a choice as to whether or not we're going to serve this God every day of our life as best we can and the power of God's presence in our life, encouraging us and giving us the ability, both mind and heart and then the process of, of reality. I have a, a good friend, Denny Shanafelt, known Denny Shanafelt for many, many years, a wonderful Christian man. And uh, Denny worked for the Ohio Bell Telephone Company many years ago. And when it became AT&T, he worked for them. But Denny, um, was a, he was a, a rough-edged individual before he came to the Lord. I mean, he, he, he had lived and was living a tough life. He was a hardened character, kind of like Mike Warnke, who was an, uh, raised as a, uh, Mike Warnke is a Christian um, a comedian, but he talks about uh, learning uh, the English language at a truck stop. Denny knew that language. I mean, he had come out of a tough background, but when he came to, to, to discover the amazing life that Christ had come into the world to give him, his world was turned upside down. He had had that dramatic experience that was talked about a few moments ago. And Denny worked for the phone company, and he says in his testimony, he says he walked out to his garage one day, and he opened the door, and it was like a big spotlight shone on his garage, and all of the stuff that he had stolen from the Ohio Bell Company was in front of him wiring and lights and telephones and who knows what all was in his garage. And he had taken it. It wasn't his. And he heard a voice from the Lord saying, put it in your truck and take it back. And so he put it in his truck. He took it back. He says to his supervisor, boss, whatever. He says, I stole all this stuff and I'm bringing it back. <laughs> you know, his boss he says, didn't he go home? Go home. Choose this day. Choose today. You know, Oswald Chambers uh, is, I use this book a lot, uh, my most for his highest. It's been around for, for a long, long time, devotional book. And uh, on day, day July 5th and July 8th, he writes these words. And it really reflects the, the idea that you and I live in the world and as believers, as those persons who have committed our life to the risen Christ and, and uh, unashamedly have a relationship with this person and want to, in the depths of our hearts, want to live out that life as best we can and know how, 
We have to do that daily on a regular basis. Pick up that cross and take it with us and live that out in practical, real ways. And uh, Oswald Chambers says these words, we tend to think that is that it is inappropriate and unnecessary to put him, talking about Jesus, first in the practical, everyday issues of our lives. Did you get that? We tend to think that it's inappropriate and unnecessary to put him first in the practical, everyday issues of life. If we have the idea that we have to put on our spiritual face before we can come near to God, then we will never come near to him at all. Did you get that? Wonderful. Take that home and think about that a little bit. And then finally, he's talking about the, the passage that, that I read for you just a moment ago about, from Joshua. And he says, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Openly, he says, declare to him, Jesus, I will be faithful. I will be faithful. Simply and freely, says Chambers, declare before him, I will serve you. I will be faithful. I will choose to do so. So you see, it is, it's all up to you. Let me have the second bullet point, if I could, and we'll move right along. In spite of this clock, we're going to move right along and probably pass the time to, that we set, uh, have set, but we'll, we'll try to draw things uh, to a close. The second bullet point, though, that I want to mention, uh, mention to you is time is of the essence. And I only have one little illustration of the truth of that. None of us thinks about that moment in time that our world and our life is going to end until you get to sort of where I am in life. <laughs> you know. But just this week, it was the 20th anniversary of the uh, plane crash and the death of John F. Kennedy Jr. Some of you may have heard heard that on the news. The interesting part about that this week, I was listening to the news and they were talking about the experience and, and what had happened, but they flashed back to a time in which John F. Kennedy Jr. was being interviewed and he was giving encouragement. They asked him, what kind of advice would you give young people today? They seem to be such, in such a hurry and they feel under the pressure to make all these decisions about life and their career, where they're going to live and all, all sorts of things like that. And he says to them, John F. Kennedy Jr. says to them, he says, slow down. You don't need to be in a hurry. You don't need to make all these decisions. The whole world is in front of you, and you've got all this time to make those decisions. And how old was he when he passed away, when he died through that plane crash? Time is of the essence. That, that, that's, why, that's why Joshua says, folks, let me tell you something. Now, God has been with us. You've witnessed that. He's watched over your lives, that terrible journey and that lengthy journey that you've experienced. You've faced all kinds of obstacles, food uh, in the wilderness and, and, and shelter and care and foes and armies. God has been with you all this time. It's time now for you and I to stand up and make a decision about what our life is going to be like. Who are we going to serve in this life. Now, you know, he doesn't say it just like that, but you know that's exactly what he, what he says. So time is of, of the essence. And the third bullet point, if I could have that, please. I want you to know, if you don't catch anything else that I've said this morning, that to serve your Lord is the best choice that you'll ever make. I know from where I come, and of what I speak. Choosing God is always the best choice. One more story. You may know this story. It's about the, the, the great hymn, Amazing Grace. Do you know the story of John Newton? Well, Amazing Grace, you know, is purportedly the most well-known song in all the world that people recognize it's, it's it's music, the minute it starts to be played, it, it, uh, that they know the words. But what they may not know is the story. And John Newton was a slave uh, uh, trader, a horrible individual. He was greedy, wanted to line his pocket at whatever cost. And, uh, and he had a life experience change and encounter with Christ. And it turned his world upside down. But it not only turned his world upside down, it gave him life. 
And so he says, you know, you know, I'm sorry, folk, but once I was blind, I just didn't see. But now I do. I was lost. I, I, I didn't know I was lost, but I was. I was lost. But I've been found, and I am found. And he goes on and writes this marvelous, marvelous hymn. And if he were here today, I don't know what all he would tell us, but he would certainly say, to serve my God was the best choice that I ever made. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, thank you so much for this time with this wonderful church, which we know that you're overseeing, watching over, and caring for. I pray your blessing upon them as they persevere in challenging times. You obviously are using this church as a testimony in this world and touching other lives through them. Continue to bless them, and Lord, be with them every day that they may consciously and intentionally choose to be one who follows you into life. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.